Dr. Turner, you were a psychologist for a high security prison. That's right. And you focused on those those cases where people just kind of shake their head and go, I, I don't understand it. I can't believe it. The stuff that you know shows like criminal minds are made out of. Right. What brought you into that area, especially when it comes to serial killers? Um, it was something that I was always interested in. Um, and then as I went through school and uh, had certain professors, the research that we were doing kind of lended itself to sexual predators, uh, violent offenders, offenders who have sadistic sexual interests. And as you start to work and do research and you meet people, then that just short, sort of shapes your career. Yeah. But it was always an area of interest for me. Yeah. You've worked with several of serial killers. You've interviewed several. I interviewed about three. And mm. what I found was each one of them, this is weird to say, each one of them, they were so nice and calm and sweet. And so it's it's really it's bizarre, but you say that's how they can do what they can do. Well, sure, because how are they? How else are they going to get you into the car? You know, right. we think of serial killers and we think of these hunchback drooling on themselves, <laughs> ambush yeah. kind of people. But really, you know, um, the most successful ones, and I use that term loosely, right. but the ones who are most able to gain access to victims are the ones that can let people's guard down or make people feel somewhat safe. Yeah. All right. So are serial killers born or made? That's a question that I think if I could answer, I'd be sitting on my own private island somewhere. <laughs> um, I think it's a combination. I think like most things in life, it's a combination. I think there are some genetic predispositions there that if certain, um, as you and I were talking on the break, if certain environmental factors are met, um, then it can lead to the, a very dangerous combination. But I don't think it's all one or all the other. Yeah, yeah, all right. Uh, let's go through some of the myths. Okay. Um, that if you're a serial killer, they kill the same type and there's a certain mode of operation they do every time. I mean, we see this in all the, all the criminal shows. Sure. Um, that is not true. Uh, when we look at, so for example, the Son of Sam killer mm -hmm. in New York City uh, was famous for shooting couples in parked cars. His first attempt um, at attacking females was actually with a knife. Um, he didn't like it for whatever reason. Um, John Wayne Gacy in Chicago the same thing, his first victim, his first male victim, he had him at his house and he used a knife. And I don't want to be too graphic on your morning show, yeah. but um, there, he, he didn't like some of the aspects of that. And so you change and you modify. And one thing is that we tend to think of serial killers almost almost like this Batman supervillain type of person yeah. that sits in their lair and thinks about how they're going to trick police and stuff like that. But these are human beings who make mistakes and drive around and maybe see a victim when they're intoxicated and they don't have their tools with them and so they adapt yeah. and they change. They they tend to because the make, ultimate thing is to kill. However, they have you know, by it, any means necessary. Exactly, and that can be a problem for investigators who rule out a certain offense uh, because it doesn't follow an MO. When actually it may have just been an odd set of circumstances yeah. that led the killer to doing it a little differently that time. We oftentimes think that they're only white men. Right. Not the case. Not the case. You know, as America becomes more and more assimilated, um, you know the. The, there's a famous line in um, Silence of the Lambs where mm -hmm. she says serial killers tend to hunt in their own ethnicity. And I think that that was true for a time, but um, it's dangerous now to make that assumption. There was a serial killer case that I worked peripherally on out of Baton Rouge, Derek Todd Lee, who was an African-American male who had predominantly Caucasian victims. And I remember um, an African-American victim showed up and Everyone was just astonished. Oh my gosh, what what does this mean? What is right, this? Right, what right. is this message it was just he's sending? It was a, a matter of convenience. In and many it was cases. just someone that he met that he was attracted to. Yeah. So yeah, so not all not all white men. Um, and and again, as America becomes more assimilated, I, I think we're seeing crossing ethnic ethnic right, boundaries. Because right. sometimes if you're if you're within your community, that's just what's in your community, right? Sure. And uh, you know, have you ever found yourself attracted to? you know, a person of this ethnicity or a person of that age group, uh, which is maybe outside of your norm, of course yeah, you have. Yeah, all right. Uh, the other myth is that they can't stop killing once they've started? Right. Um, I, I, this is something that for a long time we really believed. Boy, these guys get going and, they, and they're trucking along and they're ramping up and they're increasing in their intensity and they don't stop unless they die or they go to prison. Yeah. 
And what we've learned over the last several decades is that that's simply not true. And it seems like sometimes it's their coping mechanism. And right. so that's when they kill and then things get back on level. Let's say, for example, they lost a job. Exactly. And then they go berserk and then they get, get a job and then they go back to their normal exactly. life, right? Well, if there's one thing that we've learned so from Ted Bundy is mm -hmm. that it's, it's important to look at these individuals as human beings, people that have wives and jobs and divorces and the Deaths measles and, and sure, yeah. exactly. And so there are things that can interrupt uh, a pattern of killing. And so guys like BTK and the Green River Kilo Killer went decades without killing. Yeah. All right. Uh, we've also heard that if you have a child who has the trifecta of bedwetting, mm. fire, setting fires, and hurting pets, mm. watch out. Well, that is a dangerous combination, <laughs> and I can't say that, that that it's not. It is. If you see that in your child, it's something that you may want to address or get that child into, into therapy or something like that. Um, the the bedwetting or enuresis is something that's kind of been taken out of that trifecta because there are so many children that are affected by enuresis right. who don't necessarily have these other conduct disordered behaviors. So, but if someone's playing with fire and and skipping school, certainly and, hurting animals. Of I mean, course, yeah. hurting animals, keeping keeping dead animals, experimenting with them, uh, that's a problem. There, there's something going on there that needs to be addressed. All right, all serial killers are psychopaths, but not all psychopaths. Are serial killers. What is a psychopath or sociopath? And sometimes we, we see those kind of you know used with each other. Right, they're inter they're interchangeable. Yeah. I think um, a psychopath is someone who um, is unable to empathize with other people. So, and there have been some really interesting studies that show that when a psychopath looks at pictures of human faces mm -hmm. exhibiting universal emotion, shock or fear. Uh, their brain doesn't light up the same way our brain lights up, assuming we're not psychopaths. Yeah, right. <laughs> right? Um, so there is there is a physical difference um, in their ability to empathize with other people. It's it's simply not there. And then there are also which is what makes it easy for them to hurt or kill people, of right? Because there's and, no emotion. Of behind course, it. and sleep at night and live with themselves, right? But there's also this sense that they're they're out for themselves. That what they want is is what they're going to get, and it doesn't matter who they have to step on to get it. Now, if they have a sexually deviant urge that requires hurting people or victimizing people, then you can end up with a serial killer. Yeah. But if you have psychopathy and you have no sexually deviant urge, you might just end up in politics. Or yeah, you well, might just well, end up it's funny like Bernie you say, Madoff or something lot, like that. A lot of top executives and politicians have some of these psychopathic sure. traits. And it's interesting because even uh, kind of that narcissistic trait as well, uh, Raphael Resendiz, who was a serial killer who terrorized Houston and, and, and other communities around Houston, sent a letter to my house. And mm. we had written a letter to him, Cynthia Hunt, who was a reporter at the time, written a letter to him saying, you know, I have a dog too. And I understand that you love your dog more than anything. He says, my dog was the best to me. My dog understood me. And so when she wrote that letter to him and, and she basically connected with him over the dog, he decided to send a letter and it came to my house and he outlined the reason why he killed everybody. He justified the reason why he killed everybody, and he thought mm -hmm. that you know it was it made sense, mm -hmm. you know. And so that again, that narcissistic moment, you can't just go killing people. But to him, he no. said, "I did the right thing." He did the right thing, and he expects you to understand mm -hmm. where he's coming from when he tells you yeah. that he did the right thing, which is almost equally as scary. Yeah. All right. A psychopath or sociopath is oftentimes drawn to strong, successful people. Uh, it's a greater challenge and more rewarding. And if they right. have that narcissistic moment, thinking that they're at a high level, then they only want to be around high-level people. That's right, absolutely. So when you think of psychopathy in the white-collar world, and mm -hmm. you think of psychopathy among uh, board members, uh, politicians, people like that who are, are quite willing to crush someone else to get to the top or something like that, you, you do see that sense of, you know, the, the, the higher level in society person I can take down, that makes me that much higher. Yeah. You know. All right, through association, right? Sure. One to four percent of the general population, uh, so that means like in Houston, maybe, maybe as many as 23,000 psychopaths. Right. right. Not necessarily killers, but psychopaths. Right. Um, what to look for? And this is one yeah. of those things where these traits are what to look for in case somebody might be dangerous to you or even in relationships, right? right. Um, highly narcissistic and overconfident. We talked about that. Some other things? Um, there's going to be a shallow sense of emotion. So when you're in situations where people would have a normal reaction, yeah. a funeral or, you know, watching The Notebook or something like yeah, that, yeah. your uh, your partner is going to tend to not have that emotional reaction. They're, they're, they're on the shallow end of the pool, if you will. Um, there's also a, a callousness. There's a tendency to lie. They lie very, very, very easily. These guys lie sometimes when it 
would be even easier to tell the truth. Right. Um, very oftentimes there's a, a parasitic lifestyle, uh, promiscuous sexual behavior. By parasitic lifestyle, I mean they live off of the graces of other people mm -hmm. while making it seem that they're there to help or being the hero. Um, so don't accept responsibility for their mistakes and become no, aggressive quickly. Right. All right. Um, early detection. Do you think you could go to a junior high school and hang around the kids for about a week and pick out, not necessarily that serial killer, but that one who has the tendency? I love that question. I, I, I hope so. I think that I, I think could. I've seen them. That might be all junior right. high kids. <laughs> right. I think I, I think I could. I think we could pick out. Um, children that are more likely to end up with problems than other children. Yeah. Now, whether or not they're going to act out sexually because of some type of sadistic urge, I think we'd have to do a bit more digging. When it comes to the uh, police work side, what's been different since uh, Ted Bundy, and I'm going to talk about that in a second because uh, we're coming up on that anniversary, is that we have DNA today. DNA sure. has been kind of a game changer beyond just being able to, to match the DNA to the person who's done a crime. The Golden State Killer, for example, was caught with DNA and, and explain to folks how that happened. And does that type of thing run in families? Well, um, we do see sometimes, uh, so in, in, you mentioned Ted Bundy, so in Ted, in Ted Bundy's case, the man that raised Ted Bundy or Ted Bundy's grandfather, who was some believed to be his actual father, uh, was, was a very angry, sadistic fellow. Mm -hmm. um, so, so again, I think there's a genetic component to it. Um, but with DNA, so that's what, earlier when we were talking about how things have changed and our investigative strategies have changed, in some of these cases where there's these cold cases and we have a victim and we have DNA on the scene and then lo and behold it pops up that it's a victim of Henry Lee Lucas or someone like that, we are finding out that, well, but she was strangled as opposed to stabbed right, or she right. was shot as opposed to, so we're learning that, hey, DNA can't be argued against and this is a victim of this killer. It was just done in a very different way so he was never even assumed or looked at at that time yeah, as and, a suspect. And how to find people is like, you know, that the whole 23andMe and Ancestry.com, all that type of stuff, family tree, all of a sudden you go, okay, well, this person is a relative of that person. Do you know where that person is? It's like right. You can actually find, connect the dots, if you will. Right, Let me exactly. wrap up with, with Ted Bundy because it really did change the way uh, law enforcement and people in the medical community looked at the so-called serial killer. Right. Um, so the detective uh, that was the lead detective in that case was Dr. Robert Keppel. He wasn't a doctor at the time, but um, it was the first, one of the most fascinating things about the Ted Bundy case to me that I think a lot of people don't know is that it was the first time that there was a computer program used. Now we're talking 1973, so the mm -hmm. computer was probably about the size of this room, right? Um, <laughs> it was the first time that a computer was used in an investigation of a serial killer. Uh, they didn't even, that wasn't even a term that was used a lot back right. then. But they were inundated with tips. They had, someone had overheard him use the name Ted when abducting a victim. Um, so they knew that was either an alias or that was his real name. Mm -hmm. So they had other things they knew, like the Volkswagen bug and things like that. They're, they had about four Good or five things. Good looking guy, nice guy. Right, yeah. that they knew he had to meet all of these criteria for to be their person. And so they're inundated with thousands and thousands and thousands of tips. Uh, and so they programmed this computer to kind of shuffle through them and spit out just the ones that meet all of those criteria. Mm -hmm. And so it's this smaller stack of maybe a hundred guys out of all those thousands. And he was two or three down wow. when they caught him uh, in Utah. So. Um, I, I, be, I believe, and a lot of people believe, it was only a matter of time before they would have really focused their investigation on him. Yeah, all right. January 24th, the 30th anniversary of his execution. That's right. Wow. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the type of guy that yeah. goes to a party and is stuck in the corner by the punch bowl because when we find out what you do, we, we're not letting go of you, right? That's right. But unfortunately, TV time, I got to let go right. of you. I just tell people I'm a counselor. <laughs> yeah, right. There you go. We still will be stuck <laughs> yeah. in the corner by the punch bowl. For more information on Dr. Gerald Turner and how you can get in contact with him, visit GreatDayHouston.com.